The uh, call for our gathering, the uh, announcement, part of the con which brought you here, mentioned the edge of the millennium, at the edge of the millennium. And uh, so far, the millennium has been present by subtle implication alone. So I think to honor our commitment, we'll now trilogue on the edge of the millennium. Is okay? It's okay. Now, in our just appeared new book, The Evolutionary Mind, there is a chapter near the end called, I forget what it's called, it's about utopianism and millenarianism. Two pretty long isms which all together add up to an overdose of different approaches to the future which are more or less classical. And there we spoke extensively of the extant literature and literary tradition and industry of a utopian and millenarian genre. So that kind of utopian and millenarian stuff is not what we're going to talk about in this trilogue. I want to introduce a completely different notion of the millennium and I am interested more particularly in the edge of the millennium. And uh, here's how it goes. This is partly, uh, according to me, a mathematical view of history that brings up this particular version of the idea of the millennium. And uh, nevertheless, other people have written a similar view of history without any explicit recourse to mathematics. So I think it's pretty general. It has to do, this view of history, with the approach we've taken toward biological evolution that it goes forward in uh, catastrophes and critical leaps and, and so on, sudden jumps. The <clears throat> punctuated equilibrium approach to history says that history goes along in a kind of a level a plateau, developmentally speaking, although there may be a gradual development up or down overall. And then every once in a while there is a big leap. The first uh, such view of history I think that we know about was presented by the ancient Egyptians. So this is uh, nothing new. Now in my own work I have classified uh, some major plateaus including uh, <clears throat> the last one, the one that we're at the end of now according to my system of history began 6,000 years ago or 5,500 years ago with the invention of the wheel and the first city-states and stuff like that. Talking Schumer, talking Babylonia, talking ancient Egypt here. And uh, so that's a 6,000 year plateau. Now other people, for example, uh, Bill Thompson, somebody we know and talk to about world cultural history, he has a similar scheme in which the plateau now ending is only uh, three or four hundred years old. See, there were the people who, went, who really wrote about this uh, explosion idea in world cultural history was Jakob Burkhardt. Burkhardt said the Renaissance was a quantum leap in world cultural history, and then other people said, well, what about Giotto? You know, what about Patatrio? What about Boccaccio? And... Um, the truth is that whenever you look at two major milestones in history and consider the between the milestones to be a sort of a level road, then somebody will come along and find a smaller milestone in there. Nowadays we have fractal geometry, so we think that this is na natural. Between any two big catastrophes, there'll be 10 smaller ones. Between any two of the smaller ones, there'll be 40 or 50 little or teenier ones, and so on. The first person I know who put forward such a fractal idea of history that it's not continuous, it's discontinuous, but the discontinuities are more or less dense, as in a fractal, the first such person is you, Terence. I give you credit in writing in my 
entry in the Encyclopedia of Time. You maybe have never read that book. Never read it. Well, there you'll find your name mentioned in a flattering way by me of all people. Immortality at last. At last. <laughs> <laughs> Well, to make a long story short, it's these uh, controversial plateaus of history that I'm going to call millennia. And then if you want to go back to chapter 10 of the evolutionary mind and to read there about the history of the millenarial concept, then you'll see that the first one, wherein the number 1,000 was actually mentioned for the length of one of these plateaus, gave his name to the thing, it was a special case of my more abstract idea of millennium. It's the plateau of history. And what I mean by the edge of millennium is those times when there's the snap out from one equilibrium to another. Cro-Magnon comes out of Neanderthalus or whatever it is. And uh, oxygen comes out of the archaeobiological background and whatever. And the interest of this, according to me, is why, why are we here? Who would talk about the evolutionary mind? Who cares about the uh, good and evil and the evolution of species and so on? This must be interesting only to the degree to which it informs us in this very present moment regarding our choices that we will make in the creation of the future. So according to chaos theory and its uh, partner theory of bifurcations, this is one of the main things that teaches something like the butterfly effect that you've heard about. In a dynamical system, or a massively complex dynamical system such as we live in, when there is a moment of bifurcation, which is the technical math jargon for these snaps, that is the only time you get to do anything about the evolution of the system. So according to this, self-inflating view, we live at a specially important special moment in history where when we think something or do something, it has actually an enormous effect on the future. Maybe not a direct determinative effect, but we can't really say what the outcome will be, but what we do has some influence on the creation of the future more than other times in history. And the bigger the jump, the bigger the leverage, where Archimedes said, give me a lever and I'll move the world, we have a lever now. And we care about what's coming next. So that's why the edge of the millennium, any edge of any of the millennia, is particularly important to those revolutionary souls who want to make a change in things. It's a special time. A century or two centuries ago, you could struggle for the creation of a chaos revolution, and it would be impossible because there were no computers around, or there were no um, movie makers in Hollywood or something. I don't know. It takes more than we know about to create these special opportunities. And anyway, that's what I mean by millennium, and that's what I mean by at the edge of the millennium. And now this is only a hypothesis for the sake of discussion, but I kind of think that this uh, is very credible that we are at the edge of the millennium. And now this is only a hypothesis for the sake of discussion, but I kind of think that this uh, is very credible that we are now at the edge of the millennium. Therefore, we, we have to discuss this. And the question that I'm going to uh, pose to you, Rupin Tear, if this isn't uh, too radical, is <clears throat> to what degree do you think actually that what we are doing now matters in the creation of the future? And if there is any possibility that what we do matters in the creation of the future, what kind of future or what kind of change are we trying to create? And to what degree what we are actually doing, for example, what we are talking about today, what we are doing today, to what degree could that possibly be a real effect, a real benefit in um, creating the future that we want to create, in contrast to other things that we might do, like go to the beach and pray or whatever. 
And particularly, <laughs> can I stop here? Well, that's well, one what I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, I'm trying to make this easier for you because I think this might be too difficult. Uh, as we Well, I mean, I think I said this morning, or maybe I didn't, but I believe it and have said it many times, salvation is an act of cognitive apprehension. So we do matter. Because to the degree that we are ignorant of vidya in the, in the Buddhist lexicon, we retard universal progress towards some kind of enlightenment. But the doctrine of avidya, this is standing for all time since 1800 BC. Do you agree that this is a special moment? Yes, I think so. Not only a special moment, but the other thing I would call people's attention to is the fact that no matter whether you scammed your way in here today and no matter whether you're going to go back to a appliance box that you live in under a bridge, the odds are that you, you are very close to the top of the pyramid of global empowerment. You are mostly white, mostly well-educated, mostly have enough disposable income to come to an event like this, it's worth pointing out that all that rides on the backs of those who do not have such privilege. And so, yeah, this is a moment of enormous opportunity, and those who find themselves in this moment with power, defined however you care to define it, have a moral obligation uh, to act. And I don't advocate a certain political agenda, not that we must become Marxists or that we must become anything. What we must become is clear. Uh, we have the technologies and the informational structures and all the necessary abilities to create paradise on earth, to lift up the least among us to at least an acceptable uh, level of comfort and freedom. Why do we not do that? Because what stands in our way is our own minds, our own habits. We must change our minds. That's the most powerful political work people in this room could do. And there is nobody who is so enlightened that they don't need to work on themselves and do this. To the degree that we can change our minds, we will escape extinction, marginality, and so forth and so on. And to the degree that we cannot change our minds, we will prolong the agony, perhaps unto death and extinction, perhaps only making the struggle more difficult. But yes, this is a moment of enormous a opportunity. Yes. We have a yes. A yes. <laughs> So we, uh, you, you agree that it's a moment of special opportunity over the long and short scales of time according to um, either mathematics or novelty theory? Yes. And you <laughs> agree that we have a responsibility to do our best? Yes. And what you have to tell us is that if the 200 of us here change our minds, that that would somehow have an ameliorative effect on the rest of the world and our creation of the future. Yes. How? <laughs> How would it have this effect? Yes, by telepathic means, by the romance of photons. No, I think by the spread of clarity. The spread of clarity. The elimination of redundancy in the system and uh, uh, the spreading of a sense of shared purpose and the possibility of achieving that purpose. It doesn't matter what you do beyond changing your mind for a better clarity? Well, I don't want to say absolutely it doesn't matter, but I think that's the first obligation. If you and charge you off with some political agenda that is not informed by clarity, you're going to end up with business as usual. The road to hell is paved 
with good intention, but it is not paved with clarity. <laughs> so your, uh, for example, what you do in my, if you barnstorm giving lectures, you write books and you create a website. And the effect of this, hopefully, will be to promote clarity. Correct. <laughs> well, first of all, I certainly agree that for me personally, psychedelic experience has enhanced clarity, whereas some people think the opposite. Well, let us have vigorous debate by informed parties <laughs> on the subject. <laughs> Don't forget, I've given over 300 calculus lectures in this room. <laughs> it boggles my mind to look out and think, well, yeah, this is Santa Cruz. This must be Santa Cruz. No, this is the real Santa Cruz. What do you think, Rupe? Well, I, the question really is, I mean, changing minds, we're talking, the, you were talking about the butterfly wing effect. The question is, if we change our minds, can it have a larger effect on other people's minds? Yes. Because if we decide to recycle yet more newspaper and so on, it's not going to have that much effect. The, the changing mind thing, the butterfly wing analogy, suggests some major change of mind spreading through our culture. Now, I suspect that you think the medium for this transformation is the World Wide Web. I suspect that Terence thinks the media... Well, I think telepathy is equally powerful. <laughs> yes, but... Um, Wait, I want to hear a suspicion of me. <laughs> World well, Wide Web? Yes, I no, think... No, no, psychedelic drugs. World Wide Web, psychedelic <laughs> drugs. <laughs> I don't... I still haven't understood the psychedelic drug agenda. We, Britain has the highest percentage of psychedelic drug consumption in the Western world at the moment. And it's not entirely clear that this has resulted in clarity spreading through. <laughs> Britain is the source of and um, the fountainhead of the worldwide youth culture that is creating the new music, the new dance, the new forms of uh, community, and the new resistance to consumerist values. So don't sell the old UK Come short. to the rave tonight yes. and see clarity <laughs> created. <laughs> yes, yes, the, a crucible of clarity is home at last closed. <laughs> <laughs> and Terence takes the microphone. <laughs> and... <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not always perfectly clear what's going on when you have your nose in it, you know. <laughs> well, I mean, my own agenda relies partly on the World Wide Web, not as strongly as yours. And I, here in this room is Matthew Clapp, who kindly runs my World Wide Web site. Um, Shellbreak.org. Yes. <laughs> so... But my own view is that this clarity involves breaking the spell of rationalism, Cartesianism, a spell woven more powerfully than ever before this morning by Terence. Um, I mean, it took on a new level of spellbinding um, in the way you described it. It's to recognize that we're far more interconnected, uh, we're far more participatory in our relation with the world than this cognitive um, kind of science and cognitive model of the mind would tell us. And so I think the secret to waking us up, one of the secrets, is psychic pets. As you know, this is one of my <laughs> particular themes. <laughs> um, and the purpose of... I wrote a book which some of you may have seen called Seven Experiments That Could Change the World. The purpose of this was to find simple experiments that could give us clarity on issues... Uh, that we know about already, which could actually have a transformative effect on our view of the world. They're to do with changing our scientific view of the world. And the scientific view of the world is a particularly important part of the spell that binds us all and that affects our whole um, civilization, our whole industrial culture. And it's an exceptionally narrow and dissociated view of the world at the moment. The reason I think psychic pets 
could play this part is, first of all, there's more of them than psychedelics. I mean, they're everywhere. Um, there are lots and lots of dogs and cats that have telepathic bonds with their owners. About 50% of Americans feel that they've had a telepathic bond with an animal. Now, to recognize what so many people already know, through experiments to test these to see if they're real, and so far the experiments suggest they are real, um, this can give permission for people to recognize what they already know. Then all these closet holists, uh, or most of us are closet holists, can come out and um, recognize that there's this kind of interconnection with other species and with each other uh, that's been going on all the time, but which has been suppressed from the level of supposedly rational discourse by the idea that this is all superstition, it's not scientific, it's irrational, and so forth. I think that the, one of the big difficulties in our culture is the split between the rational educated part of our minds, which we put on in public, and the participatory sense of connection which we have at home with gardens, plants, children, animals, lovers, and our nearest and dearest. And these are so dissociated that it's very hard for people to recognize that they're related in any way. Lots of dogs know when their owners are coming home in a kind of telepathic manner and wait at the door for them uh, while they're on the way home. I calculate that tens of thousands of American scientists have dogs waiting at the door for them when they get home from the laboratory, <laughs> even if they come at unusual times and in an unusual way. Yet, this phenomenon has been so subject to taboo that it's never been investigated scientifically at all. It could have been investigated at any time in the last 500 or 5,000 years. But the fact is the first investigations are happening um, at present. Here in the room is David Brown, who works with me, is based in Santa Cruz and is doing experiments with psychic dogs, cats, and cockatiels in Santa Cruz County. And if any of you have such animals, please let him or me know at the end, because we'd love to investigate your animals. Um, and to, to, you can take part in this research. So I think that grassroots research, based on phenomena that are actually common sense, that are part of everyday life for many people, could help to wake us up, to give a greater clarity about what's really going on, and make us recognize that there's far more interconnection between us and other species, and us and other people, uh, than is admitted in the scientific view of things, which is the world view which most people feel they have permission to talk about in public. So I think that this transition, a butterfly wing effect, um, would be a few dogs and cats that do this being proved scientifically to be able to do it, shown on TV, um, would probably overnight give millions of people permission to recognize and talk about these events in their own lives. And never again would this subject be able to be stuffed back into the closet. Um, I think these could lead to a great change in the way we think about the world. Now, it's not, of course, it's several steps from that to solving the eco ecological problems of the world to dealing with the problem of multinational corporations and so on. But it's a step towards clarity, and it's one that could spread very quickly. Well, it seems to me the overarching theme here that unites all three of our positions is boundary dissolution. Psychedelic drugs dissolve boundaries. The World Wide Web dissolves boundaries. And certainly the discovery that our pets are communicating, anticipating, and understanding us is a boundary dissolving perception. Uh, so really what we're saying is we must dissolve the artificial boundaries that confine our perceptions. Someone once said, if we could feel what we are doing to the earth, we would stop immediately. Because a man hitting himself on the head with a ball-peen hammer stops immediately. The feedback <laughs> loop is very short. So we have compartmentalized our lives, and this allows us to do the fatal and lethal work that is destroying the planet, destroying community, so forth and so on. Uh, so maybe three answers as diverse as you've just heard here, you might search your own soul and ask uh, what obsession or interest of mine would contribute to the grand project of boundary dissolution. 
certainly it is not the affirmation of cultural values. Culture is a scheme for maintaining and creating boundaries. It replaces reality with a, a linguistically supported delusion. And behind that delusion then pogroms, programs of genocide, arms races, sexism, racism, all can operate very, very comfortably. Uh, Ralph earlier mentioned love. Uh, generally speaking, love is a boundary dissolving enterprise. So I think each of us, the three of us, all of you, in our way, should find ways to express love. And it's not, it's not treacly, it's not woo-woo, it's a very practical matter that has thousands of expressions. As long as we believe in mind and matter, rich and poor, living and dead, aboriginal and advanced, black and white, man and woman, then we're inevitably going to carry on a dualistic analysis of our dilemma and we're going to produce incomplete agendas and answers. Well, this is, uh, this is good. I agree with everything. I admire you both for your revolutionary efforts. I, nevertheless, I can't help having a sinking feeling. Here we are in the University of California. Naturally, my thoughts turn to the educational system. Now, we have here a group, uh, I know there are actually a few undergraduates of the University of California and Santa Cruz are here by accident, as it were, and that's cool. But we have not yet taken over one uh, regularly <laughs> offered course of the university uh, to enable students to learn science by doing research projects with psychic pets. Um, well, Ralph, we, the university is the last place where you would look for this. The well, university is the manufacturer of these cultural values that imprison us. Well, that's why I'm bringing up this subject of education at this time. I think we've discussed the problem of education before, but my experience is that no amount of clarity in this group of 200 and other like groups is going to matter one whit when we are all adults. You see, the, um, the next generation will have to face the same butterfly problem with the same lever because the majority of people will have their uh, paradigm set in a K through 12 in some archaic school system that sees its primary business to work against a worldwide cultural revolution. So the inertia, we have to overcome inertia, and we can talk about religion and the psychedelics and getting clarity and, and so on. We know that the scientific establishment is a big obstacle as far as environmental problems are concerned, and so Rupert's work, the ultimate effect will be to deconstruct or revolutionize science, is very important in making a transformation among adult scientists worldwide. How can this matter at all? if there is no change in the educational system K through 12, pre-K, pre-pre-K, and back to the womb, the parents, and, and so on, that this chicken and egg loop has got to be touched <coughs> somewhere in a more sensitive spot than the adult community. And, and what do you propose? Well, you work with youth, I guess. You're interested in talking with younger people. And um, Rupert, I know that you're particularly active in education through the existence of your children who are now subject to the educational system mm -hmm. that, that does this uh, criminal brainwashing that I'm talking about. Mm. So um, I'm, I'm just posing this now. Do you have any idea as to the transformation of our school system by a change of curriculum or, uh, or the entrance of any uh, weird idea into the actual program which trains most children worldwide? Well, I ought to have. Um, there's a story that perhaps not everyone here is familiar with, which is when I was in New York um, a couple of years ago, I was asked to visit a school in Long Island. Um, I was particularly urged to go there. Uh, a private helicopter was sent to take me. And I was asked to address the board and the uh, teachers of the school. And when I asked them what they'd like me to speak about, 
they said they wanted to, me to speak about the rectified Sheldrake principle on which their entire curriculum was based. So when I said, what is the rectified Sheldrake principle? <laughs> They said that that was the very question they were asking and hoping <laughs> that I would explain. I then asked who had invented the rectified Sheldrake principle on which the curriculum was based, and they soon revealed that the author of this principle, or at least the author of the documents on which their entire curriculum were based, was Ralph Abraham. <laughs> <laughs> By careful questioning, I was able to find out that the rectified Sheldrake principle meant that because of morphic resonance and habits of learning, uh, the sequence of events in which people should learn things in school should follow the historical process. So in history, you learn first about the Sumerians, Egyptians, etc. Then you move on to the ancient Greeks, the Romans, the Dark Ages, etc. That it follows the principle. Uh, and they start in grade one with ancient Egypt. I calculated on this basis that the uh, invention of the domestication of fire, which occurred between 400 to 700,000 years ago, should mean that in the toddler play groups, they should be <laughs> playing with fire. And, uh, <laughs> uh, um, I pointed this out, but it didn't, that wasn't part of the curriculum I was suggesting. I discovered that there was, in fact, an entire process of educational reform afoot in this country, behind which is the guiding genius of Ralph Abraham. <laughs> so I think we should ask you this question, Ralph, since you've more experience than most of us. Uh, well, I'd rather that people with less experience speak about it. <laughs> Because uh, my experience has been uh, very disappointing. Oh, no. No, no. no. <laughs> uh, here is the, the problem as I perceive it. Uh, maybe you can help me get through this one. The, um, the children are innocent and trusting and will try any curricular reform <coughs> experiment. They'll try anything, which they have done in different schools around the world with with great effect. It was only a couple of days ago I was at the uh, the Intel farm, they call it, in Oregon, where 10,000 people work on realizing Terence's dream. And <laughs> <laughs> Making psychedelic drugs available to everyone. <laughs> Oh, a different dream. And, uh, they know what I mean. Hips, and, not hips. <laughs> uh, casually over lunch, I revealed my um, revolutionary program for the schools to a software engineer who was sitting there. And he said, oh, well, this his historical curriculum. He said, I'm an Armenian. And Armenia went, not uh, Algeria. He said, I'm from Algeria. And my school was exactly what you, it was wonderful. And so he, th there are places in the world where even my experiment has been tried. The problem is this. The, the children, okay, the owners of the school, the people, everything is fine. The problem is with the teachers and parents. The teachers have been trained. That's one problem. <laughs> and, and the parents have been frightened, I guess. So the parents absolutely refuse any experiments that would affect their children because the danger of a failure. You see that they, they consider the current system, which is guaranteed to fail, is somehow safer than an experimental system that might fail. The insecurity itself is a source of anxiety. Well. I'm just analyzing. I don't really know what goes through their mind, but what I have discovered is that groups of parents come in and physically attack the, the teachers, the administrators, and so on to guarantee that the time-worn, um, failure-proved system as, is, is performed as it always has been. Did you see the problem? Older people seem That's to be why the Terence has recommended mushrooms. That's why <laughs> Rupert has suggested psychic pets. You see how revolutionary is psychic pets? We're talking about the parents here. After they, 
is proof to them that what they already know is true by somebody in the authority of the scientific establishment, then their truth will become true for them for the first time due to the fact that they trust authority more than they trust their own experience. Hmm. So I, I haven't given up yet. Hmm. with the educational system, but I'm, I'm still seeking some little way around this uh, very deeply ingrained habit. And, and well, part of the problem is, as the stakes rise, the clenching on the part of the geriatric establishment becomes even more intensified. So, for example, right now, uh, the worldwide epidemic of youth bashing is the most counterproductive thing we could possibly generate. I mean, we're leaning on the very people who are going to have to save the situation. <coughs> Why not admit the obsolescence and bankruptcy of the old models and take our foot off the neck of youth and honor uh, <laughs> an interest in psychedelic experimentalism, sexual redefining of roles, a new look at how we relate to work, a new look at how we relate to community. Instead of marginalizing youth culture and defining it as a phase, misguided, naive, foolish, we should say these are the uncorrupted people in society who have not yet felt the hammer of the programming and the guilt and the creodes of economic necessity and try to build upward and outward from youth culture rather than uh, suppressing it. For this reason, I will be appearing at a rave tonight that starts after my bedtime. <laughs> yeah, really. I wish I could um, be persuaded by your persuasive rhetoric. Um, I'm, my experience of youth culture is here are people who from the age of two have been watching hours a day of television um, shaped by commercials cunningly designed to introduce toddlers to the consumer society whose music is dominated by a music industry run by cynical interests, manipulative people, public relations operations and large corporations. So to see this as uncontaminated, pure, the spirit of tomorrow, uh, untarnished by the vices of today, seems to me to beg a number of questions. <laughs> However, well, let me answer I'll be your... there at the rave tonight too, Terence, and there I'll be able to see this paradise that's unfolding before us. <laughs> Your point about television is well taken. I totally agree. I think this is the most pernicious programming and propaganda device around. It's about to be strangled by the World Wide Web. Well, and, you know, you can just turn off your TV. And I don't, I say that as someone who did. I raised my children without television because rather than just giving lip service to the idea that it's stupid, we actually acted on the perception that yes, it's stupid. Yes, and we do too. But your yeah. other point about the youth culture's music being ha in the hands of capitalists and record companies is slightly out of touch with what's actually happening. For $500, you can buy a CDR burner. Bands do this, and most youth culture music is now put out in editions of under a 1,000 pressings, and really the corporate middlemen have all been gone around, and the big record corporations are not at all in touch with real tastes and real creativity in the music business. They recycle garbage that they support with massive public relations programs at the same time that real creativity is alive and well and thriving on a <laughs> fractalized micro scale that goes right around the desires of mass consumerism. Sorry to interrupt. <laughs> I don't, I just, uh, it would be good if there could be an experiment carried out, perhaps with you as the cheerleader, for this uh, youth culture of tomorrow actually to be able to be 
permitted rather than suppressed and so on to see what happens. Uh, in my, I mean, there are quite a number of experiments in this I would have thought going on spontaneously. It's not as if all these people involved in this culture are totally controlled by parents, teachers, etc. Many of them are not under direct control in this way at all. Um, so, but you're still going to have to have educational systems, school systems of one kind or another. And it's not clear to me that uh, you know, more raves and psychedelics are going to automatically to generate that. Well, I would offer as an example, I think the place on the planet where youth culture is most in control of the social agenda, uh, in other words, where youth's preference for psychedelic drugs is honored, where youth's music is honored, where microeconomic systems built by youth are honored, is uh, <clears throat> the Netherlands. Holland, lowest AIDS infection rate in Europe, lowest heroin addiction rate in Europe. Heroin is legal. Prostitution is legal. There are actually very large-scale social experiments going on that embody the values of youth culture, and they're producing saner, less stressful, more life-affirming in human societies than anything going on inside the high-tech industrial democracies that are the that set the global agenda. I think. Well, I often visit Holland, and I must say I haven't quite noticed such a striking distant difference between them and the rest of Western Europe. Well, but that's really because you come from London, where also these yes. things are happening. But if you lived in Berlin, or Rio de Janeiro, or Houston, I think the contrast with the Netherlands is quite astonishing. Mm. Didn't mean to stop the show, folks. <laughs> 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 Ralph, you're not saying enough. <laughs> oh, am I guilty then of too much self-indulgence? No, you've posed important problems. Yes. You've shown how on the edge of the millennium great steps or small steps are needed that magnify through butterfly effects. Yes. You've asked me and Terence what you think they should be. Yes. You've told us you're disappointed by your own experiments with the reform of the educational system. Yes. So, what next? Well, <laughs> well, as, as I say, I, I think that we're at uh, the edge of a millennium. We're at a turning point. What may be coming down the pike uh, could be two or three miracles that will decidedly change the definition of the problem. And in the meanwhile, I think that we're more or less stuck in the situation where we keep trying what we're doing and um, believing that it has at least some chance of having having an effect. I think that <clears throat> the uh, the educational system might change itself by a miracle, for example. And it could do that in a way that had nothing whatsoever to do with any of our efforts, or in fact it may be that some little thing that we did mattered. I, th I think that your work in the revolution of science is uh, very important and, and very promising, and it's uh, proceeded with essentially without funding because the the genius of the program that you've evolved is that it has uh, this enormous leverage and at every uh, crossing of the road you've take, made the right choice to get more leverage. And uh, uh, Terence, I think that your, your program also is, is a good one in that it's over the years changed in the direction of younger people and that you've been, uh, you know, changed your approach to maximize and I don't uh, see in either case that there's an enormous backlash working against you that um, other revolutionary movements have been stopped by a backlash and although you don't have funding you don't have uh, groups uh, calling you up and threatening your life and, and so on. In, in my own case I have felt, uh, I've, I've written about this endlessly, besides writing mathematics, I write that mathematics is important. And through the microscopic analysis of the hinges of history, the edges of millennia past, I have uh, pointed out 
exactly where in each case mathematics had a key role in the miracle and the bifurcation that happened. I think that a uh, society that rejects mathematics cannot actually successfully deal with these problems. And therefore, I have activated myself uh, against the problem, especially prevalent in the United States, and concomitant with other problems that are especially prevalent in the United States, the problem of math, anxiety, avoidance, and uh, misunderstanding. Mm. And uh, here I would say that there is a huge uh, institution, more or less, uh,